Tunisia votes on a new constitution that could take the country back to its old ways. Film directors behind bars in Iran, the social media post that landed three of them in prison. And the Ghanaian anti-LGBTQ plus law that, if passed, means trouble for journalists. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and examine how news is reported. It has been one year now since Tunisia's young democracy fell. Its parliament suspended, its prime minister removed from office. On Monday, July 25th, the country will hold a referendum on a new constitution, one proposed by its president, Kais Saied, the man responsible for last year's coup. Back in 2011, the Tunisian revolution kick-started the Arab Spring. It ended almost 25 years of dictatorship under Zain al Abidine Ben Ali, created a multi-party democracy and a vibrant media sector, one of the freest in the region. Since Saeed's power grab, dissenting journalists have been arrested, some news outlets have been shut down, and state-owned television is sounding more and more like presidential propaganda. Should Saeed's constitution get the green light from voters, as it is expected to, many of the freedoms that Tunisians fought so hard to win will be lost, at least for the foreseeable future. Our starting point this week is the capital, Tunis. One year ago this month, Tunisia, the country that gave rise to the Arab Spring, was the only post-revolutionary democracy still standing. But its economy, suffering from COVID, was teetering. Parliament, with no party holding a majority, was dysfunctional. And on July 25th, 2021, democracy fell. <laughs> President Kais Saied removed the Prime Minister, suspended Parliament, seized power, and started putting the squeeze on civil society. A year to the day later, Tunisians will vote on a new constitution, one that Saied approves of, which is reason enough, according to many journalists who cover him, to vote against it. What will happen to freedom of the press and the media? We've seen that Saeed first attacked legislative power and then attacked judicial power. He took all the executive power for himself. Next on the list, the fourth power, media power. The warning signs for the Tunisian media came early. The day after Kais Saied took power, Al Jazeera's bureau in Tunis was raided and shut down. The security officers said they were just following orders. Last October, the authorities took two channels off the air, Nesma and Zituna. Zituna had one of its hosts arrested after he read an Iraqi poem that was critical of dictators. <laughs> He never mentioned Saeed's name. He didn't have to. And just last month, a local reporter, Salah Atia, was jailed after doing an interview with Al Jazeera's Arabic language news channel. Atia's lawyer says his client is now one week into a hunger strike. The head of Tunisia's journalists' union says the state is out to intimidate reporters. All kinds of Tunisian institutions are feeling the heat, and the country has nosedived on the Reporters Without Borders World Press Freedom Index from 73rd last year to 94th. We've seen civilians uh, who are his political critics, some of whom are only guilty of making a, a Facebook post, being hauled in front of military courts. So we're seeing media freedoms being threatened and attacked as never before since 2011. That's not to say that the situation for press freedom in Tunisia was uh, any great walk in the park before, but 
we've seen a dramatic escalation in the extent to which media freedoms and a number of other freedoms are being threatened in Tunisia. La liberté d'expression en Tunisie a toujours été précaire. Freedom of expression in Tunisia has always been precarious, despite all the space carved out by journalists and citizens as well. But today it faces new threats, with a new constitution proposed by the president. It's all in the ambiguity, because it leaves a wide margin of interpretation that anyone in power can use as they see fit. Tunisia's democracy, which President Sayed brought to an end, was a work in progress. Many citizens had grown tired of parliamentary infighting between a Nahda, a democratic Islamic party which held the most seats, and other smaller parties of varying ideologies. They failed to coalesce. Meaningful legislation was too slow in coming, leaving some Tunisians open to President Sayed's takeover. The country's media space was also polarized. Within three years of the revolution, that deposed longtime dictator Zain El Abidine Ben Ali, Tunisia went from having five TV channels to 17. Many of them were critical of Anahta, so the party's supporters set up channels of their own, Zituna and TNN. Meanwhile, new media outlets like Inkifada and Nawat were blossoming online. Their reporting has found young audiences. As for Al Wataniya, the state owned broadcaster, Coming out of almost a quarter century of Tunisian dictatorship, its journalists have found some old habits hard to break. Public television is an old machine that has trouble renewing itself. Just after the revolution, they tried to free up their reporting a little. But we have been seeing the same practices as before reappearing on public television. وشدد الرئيس صياد على أن القانون سيطبق على كل من سيحاول بأي طريقة كانت المساس بحق الشعب صاحب السيادة. They will cover statements by the president or other officials without any commentary on what the political facts are. So they have once again become the spokespeople of those in power. There are far more privately owned channels in Tunisia than state owned. They tend to take a different approach to covering politics, featuring opinions that won't put their reputations at risk. What they've done a lot of is talk shows. Usually there's a host who is accompanied by two pundits, one journalist in favor of Said and one against him. It's a way to avoid taking an editorial stand, a balancing act that seeks to satisfy everyone. Media should have an editorial line, but unfortunately in Tunisia, it's the balancing act that prevails. Saied, a former constitutional lawyer, has repeatedly tipped the scales of Tunisian justice. Last month, he suddenly decreed that he had the power to fire judges, 57 of them. The referendum campaign has coincided with Anahta's leader, Rashid Ghanouchi, appearing in court the subject of a money laundering investigation that his party calls political. As soured as many Tunisians were by the decade-long experiment in democracy, their divided, stagnant parliament, they participated in it. Now, with their politicians sidelined, their justice system gutted, and their state-owned media muzzled, Tunisians know the fix is in. And that the constitution that millions of them voted for in 2014 is about to be replaced through the votes of a relative few. That constitution was finally passed with a resounding 93% of the vote in 2014. <laughs> that created self-regulatory bodies for the judiciary and for the media in Tunisia. Those were incomplete gains. They were fragile. There, there was a lot of work still left to be done, but instead of trying to heal the sick patient of Tunisia's unconsolidated democracy, Kaya Syed effectively picked up a pistol and shot it in the head. Repressive laws from the time of Ben Ali needed to be modified. It wasn't a perfect process, but it was an ongoing process. 
The problem with Sayyid's constitution is not just the freedoms that are absent from the text, but the powers given to a single person. The way in which Sayyid took power and understands power as something that belongs to one person with no opposition or safeguards, that's the most dangerous thing. La plus dangereuse. Turnout on July the 25th will be really low. So what legitimacy will he have if the participation rate is, for example, 10% of the electorate? Even if the result is yes, what that actually means is that there's a tiny minority who want this constitution. If it passes and he tries to enforce it, as a journalist, I will practice total disobedience. In order to maintain freedom of the press in Tunisia, the most important thing is to fully exercise freedom of expression. That is how we can protect it and sustain it. From Tunis to Tehran now, where three film directors have been jailed, not for what they've put on screen, but over what two of them said online. Minakshi Ravi has the details. The three Iranian directors, Jafar Panahi, Mohammad Rasulov, and Mustafa Ali Ahmad, are now behind bars in Tehran's Evin prison, where most of Iran's political prisoners are held. Rasulov and Ali Ahmad were arrested on July 8th over a social media post about the state's response to protests back in May following the collapse of a multi-story building. Their statement included this hashtag, urging Iranian security forces to put your gun down. It also said that public outrage over corruption, theft, inefficiency and repression had prompted the wave of popular protests. After Rasulov and Ali Ahmad were arrested, a third director, Jafar Panahi, went to the prison asking questions about his colleagues. At that point, authorities reactivated a case against him from 2010, one that carried a six-year prison sentence. Two months ago, Iran's Minister of Culture warned that those who want to stand against the guardians of Iran's security with worthless statements and delusionary remarks would face consequences. The grip the Iranian state holds on artists appears to be tightening. Many filmmakers have already been banned from working and from traveling abroad. Panahi and Rasulov were effectively under house arrest even before they were imprisoned. One of Rasulov's best-known films, There Is No Evil, happens to be about an all-powerful state and the possibilities for individuals to fall in line or resist. That film took the top prize at the Berlin Film Festival in 2020, for whatever that's worth. Thanks, Mina. Ghana's parliament is debating whether it should pass one of the most repressive anti-LGBTQ plus laws in the world. Homosexuality is already illegal there. But what this legislation does is widen the scope of what can be deemed illegal. Ghanaian journalists will have noticed there are clauses in the bill that could be used to target them. The ones that say that anything deemed to be advocacy for the LGBTQ plus community comes with a 10-year prison sentence. Despite that, many in the Ghanaian media support the bill, and their coverage of the story reflects that. Lurking in the shadows of this debate is an American element, the ultra-conservative U.S. evangelical lobby, which has been injecting itself into the domestic affairs of more and more African countries in the name of so-called Christian values. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on Ghana's anti-LGBTQ plus legislation and the problematic news coverage that might help turn it into the law of the land. Homosexuality has been illegal in Ghana since 1960, but the law has rarely been enforced. So imagine what it must be like to be a member of Ghana's LGBTQ community right now, knowing that your parliament is considering a new law that will criminalize anyone who isn't a heterosexual and give the state sweeping powers to convict. Or imagine being a Ghanaian journalist, knowing that if this bill is passed and your reporting is construed as sympathetic to gay, lesbian or trans people, you could go to jail for 10 years. So who would propose such a law and why? My name is Samuel Nate George, one of eight members of parliament who is sponsoring a bill on the promotion of proper 
Ghanaian family values and, 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 and human sexual rights. And, and let's make it clear, this bill was as a response to the provocation from the LGBTQ community. The provocation that Sam George speaks of came last year when news broke that an LGBTQ plus center had opened in the Ghanaian capital, Accra. What followed in the media was a kind of homophobic overdrive. Journalists, along with anti-LGBTQ plus campaigners, demanded the center's closure. Within a month, the police shut it down. Fantastic decision. I'm a happy man. Later that day, one broadcaster reported that the police had found two men in the building having sex, which the center called an outright lie and just another example of homophobic misinformation in the Ghanaian media. I am Ebenezer Piga and I'm the founder and director of um, Rightify Ghana, which is a human rights organization in Ghana. We have been documenting how the media are promoting homophobia. We have seen newspapers make sham investigative reports where they claim that LGBT organizations are recruiting students with laptops which have pre-installed on. We also have media promoting disinformation on HIV, which is being used by the anti-LGBT coalition to promote the bill. Eight out of ten people who have got HIV AIDS in Ghana pick it through gay or bisexual activity. We even have journalists against LGBT who have formed the group to promote homophobia. Last year, their convener said on air that they were going to show the homes where LGBT people stay. The journalist you just heard is Isaac Boma. We gave him the opportunity to explain why he'd create a group called Journalists Against LGBT. Initially, he responded, but after that, he didn't get back to us. What I also wanted was Boma's response to the allegation that he is affiliated to an ultra conservative evangelical group in the US called the Will Congress of Families. The World Congress of Families is a Christian, anti-abortion, anti-gay marriage organization that has been going around the world trying to recruit people and institutions into its ideology. The World Congress of Families is determined to fight for the natural family. We are building armies in all the major cities across the world to witness to the truth that natural family is the foundation for society. In 2019, its members arrived in Accra, and the theory is they brought the idea for this bill with them. My name is Kapia Kaoma, and I am a priest in the Anglican or Episcopal Church. Part of my work involves doing research on the, the rising hatred of LGBTQI persons in Africa. I have seen it in Uganda. I have seen it in Kenya. It's the same game in Nigeria. And what is interesting in all this, what we are seeing in Ghana are the same players. Kaoma was one of the first academics to expose the link between anti-gay evangelical groups in the US and rising levels of homophobia in African politics. He says that evangelical groups like the World Congress of Families target African countries because of their rapidly growing Christian populations. He also says that they tend to come in with a media strategy. The strategy was to take control of not just police makers. We need to get journalists who are going to agree with us. And one reason for that is if you control the media, you win the battle. There is no shortage of homophobic journalists in Ghana. The proponents of this bill are going after the few journalists who aren't. On June 7th, an LGBTQ plus activist was interviewed on Joy FM. He spoke about his activism, addressed some of the misinformation about the LGBTQ plus community, and also discussed Gay Pride Month. Opportunity to create awareness on the struggles of the LGBTQ persons. Afterwards, the Ghanaian MP Sam George, who is sponsoring this bill, came on the air. He told the journalists on Joy FM that if this bill had been in effect, they would have been prosecuted. Because you spent the last 10 minutes aiding the advocacy of a criminal act in Ghana. 
Clauses 12 and 13 of the proposed law prohibit journalists from producing coverage that is seen as promotion, advocacy or support of homosexuality. The terms are fairly broad, so I asked Sam George what would be deemed illegal were his law to pass. If you were doing a piece, for example, that, that seeks to push into the Ghanaian media space that it is an acceptable way of life for people to have sex in an unnatural manner, that will be you producing promotional material. For if you were to do a piece that seeks to highlight the, the glitz and glamour, as they put it, of, of unnatural uh, sex, that will be promotional material. But if you were doing... Mr. Mr. George, report, I, listened, I listened to you giving an interview on June 7th um, where a journalist um, who had just had an LGBT activist on the air. You said to that journalist, if this bill was in effect, then you would be prosecuted. So that wasn't promotion of LGBTQ issues. That was just the journalists doing their job. Yes, I made those comments because in that interview, they, didn't, they went ahead and asked the gentleman who claims to be a promoter of LGBTQ activities in Ghana what Gay Pride Month is all about. That she asked him to outline his, his programs for the year, spoke about his Facebook page, and asked people and asked him how people could reach out to his group. And that's why I said, now you had gone into, into the promotion of an activity. So long as Parliament has criminalized their activities now, you can no longer give them a platform and you can no longer push their activities. That is not to say the media doesn't report on their activities. The media, whenever there is their instances of political violence. You, you, you can report on the activities, but you cannot give anybody a platform. Is that what you're saying? You can give them a platform to come and promote their activities. They're two different things. The punishment for advocacy is higher than the punishment for the act. If you're found guilty of any of the acts that are criminalized, you face three to five years. But if you're found guilty of advocacy, your, your possible jail term is five to ten years. So it tells you what, what this bill is responding to. Sam George denies any backing from the World Congress of Families, but he is using the same playbook. He and the forces behind this bill know that by targeting what they call advocacy, voices and perspectives from Ghana's queer community will be silenced and their representation, their story, will be left to the homophobes in Ghana's media. The entire LGBT coalition has on countless radio interviews said that people's sexual orientation can be repaired. So we have men whom, because of what they have heard on radio, think that they can repair lesbians' sexual orientation. So we have some lesbians who are being raped. The, the voice that the LGBTQ persons in Ghana have is from objective journalists. And if that is taken away, when people lie about LGBTQ persons as raping kids and destroying families, they are creating an atmosphere where communities will start going after LGBT persons, and nobody will talk about it. And finally, the war in Ukraine has had a number of knock-on effects elsewhere like energy shortages in countries scrambling to find alternatives to Russian gas. Ukraine and Russia are also key to the global supply of grains and cereals. The disruption the war has caused to harvests and exports could, according to a recent UN report, plunge tens of millions of people into famine this year, particularly in Africa and the Middle East. One good place to start to learn about this topic is this video titled The Global Food Crisis Explained. Ukraine's food exports all but stopped, trapping around 25 million tons of corn and wheat inside the country. It's produced by The Economist and you can find it on the magazine's website and YouTube. The Africa Brief lives on Substack. It's a newsletter that reports on development stories across the continent with food insecurity high on its agenda. The Guardian, based in the UK, has a section on global development that tracks how the grain shortage affects various countries. On Twitter, search for David Beasley. He's the head of the UN's World Food Program. Karen Braun is a global agriculture economist for Reuters. 
And Wandile Silobo is also worth a follow. He's a writer and economist based in South Africa who focuses on agriculture. Those are our recommendations for understanding a food shortage that's already affecting some countries and which the experts say could go global. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.